Okay, good morning to everybody. Uh, so I'm Grégory Cher from uh, Paris, and uh, I will chair this uh, second morning session. And the uh, first speaker is uh, David Dean from uh, Bordeaux. So please, David. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's always yeah. a... Uh, is my mic working? Yes, it is. Yeah. Can you hear me? I think it is working. No? Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I have to talk like this. Yeah. If, uh, if you had a whiplash in a, in a tut tut accident in Bangalore. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, so anyway, thanks again for the invitation. It's always a real pleasure to come to Bangalore, and it's, it's really nice to see lots of friends that, you know, I perhaps you haven't seen for a while because of COVID. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, single file diffusion in spatially and homogeneous systems. And actually, uh, so I'm from the University of Bordeaux, um, uh, with the, which is the CNRS lab. And actually, I have ERC up here because it's not my ERC. I don't have an ERC. I don't do uh, these uh, things that would get you an ERC. But actually, this is Thomas Salles's ERC group, and they're interested in microfluidic systems. So somehow, I managed to tag on to this and get my flights paid. Um, and my, the condition is I have to put the ERC uh, logo up here, otherwise they won't pay me my flight ticket back, right? But this time, I didn't really need to put it up because you guys kindly paid for my ticket, okay? So this is work, actually, that I started when I was in Tel Aviv University with Benjamin Sorkin, who's a PhD student with Heim Diamond, who's a very, very clever guy. Okay, so the plan of the talk, I'm going to talk a bit about some old stuff, coarse graining effect coarse graining and effective diffusion constants. And sort of coarse graining, we talk about it a lot in physics. And actually, uh, you know, one of the examples is macroscopic fluctuation theory, which is actually used to look at uh, single file diffusion by people like Tripid and uh, Kieran Malik and Paul Kropivsky. Now I'm going to talk about single file diffusion. Now I'm going to talk about single file diffusion in terms of effusion. So effusion is basically a, a one-sided leaking problem. And I'm going to talk about how you can actually prove, which is a rather intuitive result, uh, using homogenization theory from mathematics. Um, and I'll try and explain a bit what that is. So actually, if you just think about a particle in one dimension, this could be in higher dimensions. So imagine you have a particle, but it's not just ordinary Brownian motion. You have some sort of uh, Langevin equation with a diffusion constant which depends on space. So this could be the, the potential phi is going to... So you can have a diffusion constant which varies in space and a potential which varies in space. And of course, these are the sorts of things. I mean, one dimension and two dimensions, people can use optical traps to generate these sorts of fluctuating potentials. And because you have heating effects as well due to lasers, if there's absorption, you could also expect that there'd be... a a variation of the local diffusion constants. You could also have a sorit effect, which I've not put here. So this is the, the Fokker-Planck operator. So you're just looking at this problem here. Now, the thing is, because this system, you know, intuitively you would think that, you know, this is going to be some sort of random walk at late times. You can imagine, you know, thinking of these as lattice sites. You're going to have symmetric hopping left and right because there's no bias in this. So at late times you should expect a mean squared displacement, which will go like time, with, with some effective diffusion constant. So this won't be the bare diffusion constant. It won't just be the average value of d of x. Okay? And so the idea is, you know, so if you can compute this, you can describe the dispersion of this system at late times. You can have a drift in there, uh, and you can also take into account what happens when you have a drift. So the idea is, that if I wave my hands around and say, well, actually, this process on sufficiently late, large length and time scales will have a form dp by dt is equal to, there'll be some effective Fokker-Planck operator, which you would expect to have this effective diffusion constant. So somehow this just looks like Brownian motion after it's been coarse-grained. And so if you're interested in chemical reactions and things like this in, in coarse-grained systems, you would expect this, this to be an important quantity. Now, in one dimension, you can actually do everything and actually, there's a formula here, which is called the Lifson-Jackson formula, which was published in 1962. And it's effectively, what you look at is you look at a unit periodic cell, and you work out the mean first passage time um, to some large distance L, okay? 
And using the, the, the mean first passage time, you can actually invert the relationship x squared is equal to d times t. Okay? So you can map this onto a random walk. And you, this discrete random walk, um, you can use this. And so you get this effective formula here. So this is called the Lipson-Jackson formula. And you can see that it's related to, you know, this looks like the partition function uh, for, the, for the process. So this is the L is the unit period. So this is just, if you imagine the, the process defined on periodic coordinates, this would just be the partition function. And this second term here is, uh, you know, this is a term that depends on d of x. So actually the interesting thing is that when d of x is a constant, you can see that this formula is independent. You can change the sign of phi, and you get the same result. So a particle diffusing, you invert the potential, which is an interesting result. But if, and if you set the potential to be equal to zero, what you basically find this term here will give you a constant, and this is just going to give you the harmonic, the harmonic mean. So this is, and this is sort of intuitively obvious if you think about uh, electrical circuits. So you reason in terms of conductivity. So this formula has been around for a long time. Oh, it's the inverse temperature. Okay, it's eta minus beta, t beta phi, okay? So actually, so the effective diffusion constant can be, so this, this was based on a first passage time argument. Now, if you have random potentials, if you try and do this for the Sinai model, this sort of first passage time argument doesn't work. So the question is, can you, are there actually direct formulas for calculating the effective diffusion constant? And there are a number of ways of doing it. Um, so it's, it's interesting, if you look, this is something that's not very well known in the physics literature. So Breno is a fluid dynamicist. So there's this book on macro transport processes. So they have a very, very general formalism for calculating directive, directly effective transport properties. And it's a very beautiful theory. Um, there are also methods which I'll talk about. So this is averaging and homogenization. So these are two, this is sort of fluid mechanics community. This is applied mathematics, applied probabilists. And you can also get these formulas directly in terms of, you can use a sort of statistical mechanics approach and get Kubo type formula for the effective diffusion constant. So there are three different approaches. Um, now, in this approach and this approach, now I've changed the sign of the Fokker Planck operator just to make it a positive operator here. But typically, what you have to do is so if this is, so you have some sort of variable diffusivity, you have a drift term. Okay, so if you want to work out, the average, di the, 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 the diffusion constant for this problem, right? You, you might think you have to solve a time-dependent problem, okay? But what you can actually do is you can, you can map it onto a time-independent problem. Now, what you have to work out is this P of S of X. Now, this P of S of X is the steady state solution to the diffusion <coughs> equation for the system with periodic coordinates. So, so you periodize everything. So once you learn, you, leave the unit cell, you come back on the other side, okay? So, obviously, the whole system is never in equilibrium because the system will carry on diffusing. But if you look at this coordinate modulo the periodicity, periodicity this coordinate will actually equilibrate. So you'll have some sort of steady state density, okay? So this is the solution to H P of S is equal to zero defined with periodic boundary conditions. Okay, so this is just the Fokker-Planck operator. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, in some cases there's a current, we were talking about currents, there's a current associated with this steady state, and depending on whether or not there's a current, the, the, if there's no current, the problem is quite simple. It becomes slightly more complicated in the presence of a current. And so the diffusion constant, the diagonal component, is actually given by this type of formula here. So you can see this is just... This KII of X, this is the diffusion constant in this case, this is just the average value of the diffusion constant. And you get this correction term, which involves the drift, and you have this term here, FI of X. Now, there is a drift, actually, you know, just for the case of pure diffusion, because I've written this in a, in a neato term. So, there's a, you know, so even if this drift is non-zero here, this term here generates a drift, okay? You see, if you take the derivative of K, K, KIJ with respect to J times F of X, this is a drift term, okay? So now, what you have to do is you have this, what they call an auxiliary function. You have to solve this equation here, so you get uh, an ordinary partial differential equation, no time, okay? There's an orthogonality condition, and once you've computed this object here, you can basically do these two integrals, and you find the effective diffusion constant. So it's very general, and... Uh, 
you know, but, uh, and, and in one dimension you can actually solve everything, okay? So this formalism is actually quite powerful because, you know, um, you know, I don't know if people know that pe if, if I go back to this, uh, if I go back to this original problem with the lifshitz jackson formula, uh, let's have a look. Where was it? Yeah, this formula here, you see, I was looking at a periodic system. If the force is periodic, you can have a drift force. So people look to what happens, you know, what happens when you have a drift force. And this was only solved in the early 2000s. So actually adding a constant force to this problem, the generalization of this formula was only found in about 2000, 2003 by Ryman and Ruby and various other groups. There was a, uh, and there was a German group uh, who, who did this as well, okay? But actually, the solution to this problem is basically, so they, they solved this problem using the, a, a generalized first passage time argument, which is much more complicated because of the drift. So you actually have to look at the moments of the first passage time in order to do this calculation. But actually, to a certain extent, all of these, you know, the Brenner pay, this, this Brenner formalism actually has all of these things here. You know, write down a general formula like this, and you know, but if you haven't solved it, you have to go through and do the algebra, and it's actually quite complicated. So these are the methods. So now I'm going to talk about. Sorry, David, just a quick. You mentioned an orthogonality condition down there. Yeah. Uh, is it just an integral on f equals zero? So what's orthogonal to what? Well, it, it, it means that f is, yeah, so, so, so it's, it's because actually, so what you actually have, you have a pseudo-Greens function, okay? So you actually have to, you have, you're solving the, the equation on the space orthogonal to the equilibrium solution, okay? And I think I've, I've written it down in terms of the right eigenvalues rather than the left eigenvalues. So it's not P of S, it's F in that form, okay? But you, you can also write, the, there are different, you know, because the Fokker-Planck operator isn't self-adjoint, yeah, right? right? So you can work on the left or the right. So, and it's, it's a really, it, I mean, it's, it's very powerful uh, theory. And you can, you know, so, and even numerically, right? I mean, people do diffusion in channels, very complex geometries. If you look at this set of PDEs, you can put them onto a PDE solver. You don't have to do any numerical simulations at all, right? You know, so you can do reflecting boundary conditions. We applied to this to look at channels. So that's single file diffusion. So I guess everybody knows what single file diffusion is. You have Brownian particles with hardcore interactions in a homogeneous system. So it basically means when these particles come up next to each other, this red guy is going to be reflected by the blue guy. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this red guy here, and we're going to let it evolve in time on, a, on an infinite line. These are just Brownian particles. I want to ask what the position of this tracer particle is if it started off at zero. Now you can see that it's not going to be able to diffuse, it's going to get blocked by the particles around it. But as time goes on, there'll be larger and there'll be fluctuations, right? Volume fluctuations, and you'll be able to, you'll be able to uh, disperse. Okay? So the tracer dispersion, so let me just say two important things. You have two types of disorder in this problem. You have the thermal noise, each particle is subject to a a Langevin noise because it's Brownian motion. But the other thing is, you have to look at the initial conditions, okay? Because, you know, it depends how your particles are organized. So, you know, the first, you know, I think one of the first solutions to this problem, this is Alexander and Pincus, then it was looked at, but it was looked at, had been looked at before in the probabil probability literature by uh, Harris. And then, you know, recently people have been applying, you know, so Tripidis here, uh, you know, they've been applying a macroscopic fluctuation theory to study these sorts of problems. Now, there are two types of averages. When I'm looking at the mean squared displacement, okay, so you have this guy here. Now, because I've got two types of averaging, you see there's this term that you take off here. Now, you can either decide to take the average directly here, so just think of this bar and the brackets as being a single average, but you can also look at an average which is called the quenched average, where you actually average the thermally average values of the displacement over the disorder. Okay? So these are two different, if anybody's worked on spin glasses, this is a bit like the Edwards order, Edwards Anderson order parameter in a spin glass. You know, this would be the magnetization, so the average value of the magnetization is zero, but this is a correlation due to the disorder, and this is what gives the rise to spin glass order. Okay? And the interesting thing is the quenched average, you can show it's mathematical. You know, if you're doing a numerical simulation, okay, so if I, if I was simulating the system for an, the anneal problem, I'd just set up my particles, run the simulation, do my stats, set up the particles again randomly, run the simulation. But if you want to do this calculation here, you have to run lots of simulations with exactly the same starting initial configuration. So actually, 
uh, people realize that what, instead of, if you want to measure this object, it's mathemat this is mathematically identical to the case where instead of randomly placing your particles on the line so they have a Poisson distribution, you basically put them into a, onto a lattice or a system which is hyper-uniform, okay? Now, the remarkable thing is that when you look at this dispersion, the, the memory of the initial conditions actually lasts for all time. You can see there's a factor of one over root two here, okay? So, because there's, you know, this is, a, this, so this, this factor of root two between the two is due to the fact you have an additional source of fluctuations coming from the initial conditions. But the remarkable thing is it lasts forever, okay? Okay. So, in, so in periodic, oh, well, let's have a look, so. Oh, uh, yeah, so actually, so now, imagine you look at the sort of system I was talking about. You look at a system with a random potential. So I had a, a, a periodic potential. So numerically, people have looked at this. So they've, put the, they've done the same simulations, but in a periodic potential. And they actually find that this y squared of t, so, the, the, so this is just the variance. This is the connected part defined this way. So you, you find exactly the same results, right? With your, and what you, all you have to do is you have to put the effective diffusion constant computed from the Lifson-Jackson formula into this, you replace D in the previous transparency by this D effective, okay? So these were done by these people. So it looks, so physically, it's, so it, what I'm gonna say is, the whole idea of my talk is, physically, it's difficult to see how this could not be true, right? But you have to prove it, right? And so, so the idea is, you know, so the idea is you do some sort of, you know, you look, coarse graining, right? So let's have a look, so how, how can you do this? So actually, one way of attacking this problem is to look at single file diffusion and free particles. And actually, this is, you know, the Harris work is about, it's called elastically colliding stochastic processes, okay? So particles, not articles, do not interact, but they change labels when they cross. So, yeah, articles don't interact sometimes as well. So you can see here that, you know, when the particle X2 crosses the particle X1, you know, in a free system, they were just, free Brownian motion, or any stochastic process, they would just cross like this. What you do is, you, all you have to do is you say, well, these two guys change, and you just change the labels, okay? So this is the idea of a, an elastically colliding process, okay? So you can just replace, you know, you can use this formula here. So y1 of t is the maximum of x1 and x2, y2 is the minimum of x1 and x2. So there's no, so, but the thing is, the, the other interesting thing is, if you take the labels off these particles, then it looks like a non-interacting gas. Okay, so if I just look at what's happening, I can't see anything, right? Unless I'm changing the labels. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you think that it's a good question. Yeah. So is it? Is yeah. Okay. So I well I got the imp Okay. I'll show you that it works. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, that's, that's a very good point. Okay, so, yeah, that's what I'm going to explain. So, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not I, don't, I don't, I mean, I thought, I mean, it's difficult to see how it's not true, but, you know, yeah, okay, so let's just see. There are no bad surprises. I mean, okay, if, we, if, if there'd have been a real surprise, it wouldn't have been published in PRE, it would have been somewhere else, right? So, um, anyway, so if you look at the process without relabeling, okay, so l let's have a look. So you can see that these particles have, you know, so I've got the color on here. So basically, you know, uh, this blue has come here, the red has moved to this side, okay? But if I relabel them, you see, I actually always keep the blue to be the leftmost particle um, and the green to be the rightmost particle. So this is what you, so you have to keep a track of the labels when you're looking at these problems. So keeping track of the tracer, so actually, so this, is, this is, so this is a trick that is used by Tribid and Paul, and so the idea is you look at this free particle density, and you actually say, well, if the tracer particle is initially at the origin, this is just the number of particles which is to the left of the tracer, okay? Now, if the, so the way of keeping track of the tracer particle is to say, well, this actually must be the same number, right? If I don't change that, okay? So this number is the same, and if you actually play with this, you actually, you know, so if you just manipulate this equation, this is the formula you get. You find that uh, the integral, um, so, 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 so let me see, I think, it, 
I should have had a, yeah, so you find it in, sorry, there should be a T here, right? So there should be a T here, but this is the formula you get. It's very easy to do. And you can put this in a, as a constraint in path integrals, okay? So, but there's another way of looking at that. You can look at a general effusion problem. You can look at, so this is a complete, this looks like a much easier problem. This is something that I looked at with Satya and Greg uh, for general stochastic processes. So imagine I start all of my pro particles to the, to the left of the line, and I just let them interact. So you see there's a disorder. We have the initial positions. They're all to the left, okay? And so if I look at this, so there are no particles. So n plus of zero, the number of particles which are on the right at, at, at time zero, so there's, there are no particles because I started them all to the left. And now what happens is, and all these particles are independent, so you can see if I let the system evolve, right, you see there are two particles here, right? So this is, a bit, this is the same problem as getting off the Boeing plane when you arrive at, in, in Bangalore, right? So this is... Okay, so what you can actually do is you can think... Imagine I take two independent problems. I take, so this is, the, this is the left problem. I have all the particles which are to the left, and I have an independent system with all the particles to the right. So I solve... This is n plus, so this is the number of particles which are initially on the left which have crossed to the right, okay? So this is th this row LT. You see, so this density was initially a step function here, but now it's going to evolve, and you have particles linking, leaking onto this side. Okay? And this is N minus T. So these are the particles. It's exactly the mirror problem when I start all the problems on the right. And so what you actually show is the integral between 0 and Y of T of this row of X of T. If I analyze those integrals I wrote down, it's just equal to N plus of T minus N minus of T. Okay? Which is nice and easy to see this way. There's actually a paper where they use this way back in the literature, and they say things in words. It's very difficult to understand what's going on. But it's, I mean, of course it's right, because it was Leibovitz is there, right? So, okay, so you have these two independent diffusion problems. Now, the idea is, if you're just interested in, you know, looking at some moments here, you see this y of t is going to be big. If you assume it becomes big, then this integral, rho of, rho of x of t is fluctuating, but what you can do is, if y of t is big enough, you can apply the central limit theorem. You can just replace this integral by y of t times the average value of rho of x of t. Now, in this system, rho of x of t isn't evolving, so it just stays as rho bar. If I'd had different uh, densities here, so people look at what happens if you have steps, then this actual, this actual density here evolves. But in this case, <coughs> you just get this formula here. So now if I'm interested, so if I look at this effusion problem, if I want to know where the average, the average value of the tracer, then I just take this average value. This is a symmetric problem. The average value of n plus is equal to the average value of n minus. So you get zero. And these two averages are given, so if I look at the annealed or the quenched case, I just have to calculate n plus minus n minus all squared divided by rho bar squared. Now this effusion problem is... Uh, you know, this has been looked at Derrida and Gershenfeld. Somebody else mentioned this paper, and Satya was looking at this problem. And so you're just looking at a one-sided problem. So you have this density here, um, <coughs> and you're looking at this, this density field. So it's just the average over all the, these, these delta functions. As I said, in the effusion problem as well, we still have two types of averaging. We have the disorder average over the xi zeros, the initial positions. And we have the thermal averaging over the increment of the stochastic process once the time starts, okay? So these are the two objects. This is the annealed average, and this is the quenched average. Okay, so now, so as I mentioned, there is a difference between annealed and quenched. And actually, uh, one way of looking at this, so there's a paper by Banerjee, Jack, and Cates. And so basically what you can look at is you can look at what's called the Fano factor, which is the generalized compressibility so you look at the initial distribution, <coughs> and you look at the variance of n in this finite volume divided by the average value of n, and you take the limit l goes to infinity. And this is actually the q equals zero limit of the structure factor. So this, this could actually be an interacting gas. So you can solve the problem if the particles are interacting. You switch off the interactions and let them evolve as free Brownian particles. Okay? If, they, if they're interacting when they start moving, it's a much more complicated problem. Okay, so this is the structure factor. And so, it's, 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 so it's interesting here. So you see that uh, <coughs> if you have, you know, so the, the, ILD, the ideal gas corresponds to, um, 
to alpha equal to one, and you have alpha equal to zero for the hyper-uniform case. So you have, and you can generalize this, okay? So you see these numerical simulations. So you get a whole range of behavior between the hyper-uniform, or basically crystal, right? Because it, the crystal case and the, uh, the quench case. So it's quite interesting, actually, because it's always saying, you, you know, if I take a, if I take a solid, a one-dimensional solid, I heat it up, okay? and then look at the particles as they diffuse out and, and count them, I can tell if it was a, a solid or a liquid just by looking at the vapor, which is pretty, pretty wild, actually. Okay? So that's the role of the initial condition. So this all generalizes. So actually, in this paper with, uh, with Satya and Greg, actually, um, so actually, you know, you can work out the average. So the average is just... So this is uh, the, the original left density average over the initial particle numbers. And so, you know, this is just counting. The, you just do this with theta functions. So if starting at zero, this is just the probability that I was bigger than zero, okay? So this is the average, which is the annealed and the quenched are the same in this case because it only depends on the average value here. If I look at the variance, I actually find something as well that's here, which is like this. So in the annealed, in, in, so this is the same as the, the variance in the annealed case is actually the same as the, the average because it's Poissonian, right? You have a Poisson distribution, the statistics of Poissonian. It's no longer this, the case if you look, to, look at the quenched average, and you can see that this is, this is the object. So you actually have two copies of the, the evolution, the, the, the propagator of the diffusion here, okay? So, okay? And so this P, this is, so this is extremely general. So this P, as long as the particles are not interacting, is just given by this. So this is true if I have a potential varying diffusivity, nothing changes. So these formula all go through. So the interesting thing is when you're solving this problem, um, <coughs> you want to be able to do these integrals. See, actually, so when you want to solve this problem, it's, um, it's easiest to actually look at, you have the integral of d of x of px here. It's easiest to look at this as a function of x0 because you want to be able to do this integral over x0 at the end. So actually, there's a sort of way of converting the equation. So, so this f of x0, this is the key object you have to compute. So you can see you integrate over the final position. You only have dependence on the initial position. And then the formula, for example, for the quenched, for the annealed variance, or mean, means n plus squared, is just given by this formula here. Okay? So you just have to calculate this f of x of 0. This obeys a forward Fokker Planck equation. The initial conditions are this, and this is what you get for it. So, so actually, when you make this, sorry, this, yeah. So normally, this obeys, this object here obeys a, a backward Fokker Planck equation. But if you make this transformation, it goes to a forward Fokker Planck, forward Fokker -Planck equation. It's just detailed balance, right? So you get this. So you have to solve this equation here, OK? Now, you have to be able to solve this equation for varying diffusivity and the late time limit in order to be able to do these integrals. So actually, homogenization theory, so if, if there were any mathematicians in, who did this, they would be screaming and shouting at me. So actually, so Benjamin, when we first looked at this, he actually took the maths literature, and you know, they put in epsilons, they scale x with epsilon and t with root epsilon. But actually, it's just a, it's just a late, so if you Laplace transform, it's just a late time expansion, right? So you say that f of x of s is equal to, so this you have to look at the equation in order to see what scaling to use in f. So you have s the n over 2 here, and you have x here. So x is what they call a fast variable. And you can see that this variable here, root s, late times, s is small. So actually, what you do is you treat x and y, so this is the variable you call y, as independent variables, OK? And so actually, what this means is that in the Fokker-Planck equation, you have to replace d by dx by d by dx plus s to the half d by dy, OK? And you plug that into the Fokker-Planck equation. Actually, the first term is actually only depends on the x variable. And what you actually find, you know, so, so, so f0 of xy obeys the, the steady state, uh, obeys the steady state Fokker-Planck equation. So the solution is the Boltzmann distribution, OK? Because this is, because, so yes, so this is periodic in x, right? You assume this is periodic in x. So you have the Boltzmann distribution. It depends on some function k0 of y, which you don't know. OK, then you look at the next order term, which is order s to the minus half term. And then you have an order 1 term. Now, these equations look a bit awful. But actually, they're not that awful. And actually, to get the final equations, all you have to do is integrate, for example, this equation here. 
you only have to integrate it, the returns here. The in, when you do the integral over x, because things are periodic, these terms go away. So the algebra is not as horrible as it looks like. And actually, in the end, if you do the algebra, and I think it's much quicker than all the other methods, you actually find an effective or coarse grain diffusion equation where for k0, where you have df, see? and this, this falls out, you find exactly the Lifson-Jackson formula doing the algebra. Now, if I come and look at, for example, I want to calculate uh, n plus squared in the annealed average, <coughs> you just put in this form in the Laplace transform variable. You have the integral between 0 and minus infinity. You have rho bar L0 divided by 2s. And you actually, you, so you actually have the initial probability distribution that was on the left. Now, this probability distribution on the left, we're assuming it's periodic, but it doesn't necessarily have to have the same period as the, as the, it doesn't have to be the same distribution as the Boltzmann distribution, and it can be general, right? It just has to be periodic. So when you look at this, you can see as s becomes small, you're basically integrating dx0 over something which is not varying. So over each unit cell, it integrates to 1. So the dependence of the initial distribution goes away, OK? Now, I was saying before, things depend on the initial distribution, but only in terms of the two-point function. So you can see that this goes away. And actually, formally, you can show this. You can write P0 of x. You know, so L0 is the initial period of this, of, of this distribution. And you do, when you look at the Fourier series, you actually look at the terms like this. You see that for, for small s, actually, everything is dominated by the term kn is equal to 0. So when you do this integral here, actually, the P0 of x actually disappears in the late time limit, and you actually find this result here. So we actually find, and this is exactly the result that you get from the naive intuition. I'm not going to call it naive, because I don't want to call Joachim naive, right? Okay? The, the, yeah. So, no, no, actually, no, he's not naive. I was naive. Okay? Because, okay, so you actually find you get this effective diffusion constant, and it agrees with the intuition. And so, so basically, what I was saying, and you can also show that this, this is also true for the quenched case. So in this system, this, this, this idea of coarse graining works. So for instance, if you revisit the, the problem that was looked at by Toloni et al. and Lips et al., you can take a, a, a periodically varying potential like this. Um, and if you just take the diffusion constant to be a constant, then actually what you find is uh, you just calculate, you know, you just have to do this integral because you have exponential of minus a cosine. It gives you these modified Bessel functions. So this is what you find for the quenched, the annealed case, and for the quenched case, so you see you have the root two, everything goes through, and you can see the numerical simulations. It works absolutely perfectly. Um, what people haven't looked at is the case of where the diffusion constant varies. When the diffusion constant varies, the d-effective is given again because we've got cosines. You have these, uh, these, have these z I modified Bessel functions, and so you find exactly the same result with the square root of, and you get the, the perfect agreement, okay? So, yes, you can do it. Um, so my conclusion is that the long-time effective diffusion constant can be used to characterize the long-time single-file diffusion behavior. A form of homogenization theory from applied mathematics can be adapted to prove the result. And it is very, I mean, it's, it's, I was really happy to, you know, when you do some research, okay, you write a paper, but the best research is when you learn something, right, when you're doing it. And, and I think the, form, the formaliz formalism we had. And it'd be interesting to see if homogenization theory can be applied to other problems in statistical physics. For example, the justification of macroscopic fluctuation theory, okay, which is the basis you know, of, lots of lots of the work that people do. So I think I've got five minutes for questions. Yeah, okay, okay, thanks. So I'll, I'll stop there. And if, thank you for listening. And uh, if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, David. Yeah, indeed, so we have time for questions. Yeah, I, if I understood correctly, your treatment applies even in cases where the, vari the spatial variation of D and the spatial variation of the mobility aren't identical, right? Yes, where, yeah, yeah, so yeah. it could be Landau or blowtorch kinds of problems. All the, yeah. this, this whole approach works in for those, right? Exactly, and you know, you could, I mean, you, you could do it for, uh, a general, you, you don't necessarily have to have fluctuation dissipation. You right, can look at right, a non-equilibrium yeah. system. Right. Yeah. 
And so, uh, yeah, but I did assume that d of x and phi of x are varying on the same period. Okay. Right, okay. Yeah. But that's physical, right? Because if you've got, if you're, if you're doing to your, something to your system to make it sure. periodic, then sure. the diffusion constant should, you know, pick up the same right. periodicity. Okay, thanks. Joachim? Yeah, about the square root of two difference between quenched and annealed. So I didn't quite get that. So, so can one manufacture initial conditions that have a value of that factor that is in between? Yeah, so this is, this is what I, yeah, so if you, if you go back here. So this is, so P, I mean, actually, so the business about quenched and annealed, this was known in other contexts. I mean, in the context of surface growth, Satya and Rajesh, I think, that looked at this, right? You looked at it. And so... But it, it, so here you, so this is, yes, you, you, yeah, of course, yeah, you were on that paper, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm but, but for the cape, yeah, so, so, so basically, so to answer, to answer your question, yeah, so here you see, so this is, this is, this is the variable which you can tune, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is basically, you know, the compressibility of your gas. So you're looking at the very large, you know, you're looking at how densities uh, vary on the very large length scales. So that in principle, this, this quantity here, uh, can vary. So if <coughs> if alpha is equal to zero, right, that means that basically, you know, over a large distance, there's always exactly the same number of particles. It's easiest to think about a crystal, okay? Um, but if you, uh, and then, then if you look at the Poisson case, then you'll find one, okay? But imagine you have some sort of weak interactions. In principle, you can, uh, you know, you can, you can construct a model and you can play around, you know, you find some sort of potential which will give you this Q equals limit of S of Q. So you can adapt it, right? Yeah, and, and now I actually remember, I mean, indeed this appears on the interface context, and there, of course, in the KPZ context, this is essentially uh, the difference between the flat and the stationary initial condition, yeah, right? Yeah. Which give rise to different variants of the tracy widen distribution. And I think Sporn, Herbert Sporn and collaborators have also studied the intermediate cases. So you can basically start with a Brownian initial condition yeah. that has some variable coefficient. And then you, but, but I don't remember what that means for the universality. Yeah, I think class. in KBZ it's more, of, more discrete, right? Um, well, I, I don't think flat, so. I think, yeah. I think that this interpolation has been studied, but I don't right. remember exactly how it comes out. But it's really the same phenomenon in some right, sense. Right, yeah. Of course, so it's you, more so complex but, because it's a nonlinear process. Because they have flat wedge Brownian, right? Yeah, yeah, but, but you, can, you can also interpolate between, between flat, flat and, I mean, Brownian, right, so this is a Brownian initial condition, yeah. but it can have a non-stationary amplitude, right? Right, yes, okay. So, so that's... That, that's okay, yeah, okay, so yeah, that, that would, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to, I mean, one comment is that, in fact, I mean, you know, this uh, square root two factor, it's not just for the tag particle variance, basically. There are other observables, like, for example, if we look at the local time or the occupation time for a number of particles yeah. in the effusion process, again, the same square root of two factor comes. And in fact, answering to his question, as you said, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the square root two actually is just a function of this final factor alpha IC. So by tuning that, you can actually change from one to other. But the point is that this is actually universal. It's not yeah. just for you know, the tag particle uh, variants, but for other observables as well. I mean, right. between uh, the uh, quenched and the... Uh, uh, yeah, and, it, and it's not just Brownian, right? Because yeah, we, did, we yeah, looked at, yeah. you can look at, you know, fractional Brownian motion. Yeah, yeah. And so exactly. you, you can look yeah, at absolutely. general processes. Yeah, yeah. This root two is always here, right? So I, I had just one more question, David. I mean, so if you look at 2D, for example, okay, then for constant, you know, diffusion problem, we know that, you know, the, the I mean, it's known that uh, it's, it's, you know, there's a log correction to the diffusion behavior, basically. It's not t to the one quarter, as in 1D, but it's t to the power half divided by log t, basically, just for a single tag particle. So if you look at the, you know, just a two-dimensional problem and uh, with the hard core repulsion and just look at one single tag particle and you ask what's the mean square displacement. Okay? Right. This is just t over log t. This is a Leggett's result, old result, okay. So I wonder if your, uh, this th theory will work in two dimension as well. I mean, uh, if you take yeah, a two dimensional yeah. spatial variation and uh, this homogenization theory uh, probably can be extended there also. Yeah, per perhaps, you know, if you, yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you end up having to solve it, I mean, basically the PDE is, you know, you make this scaling ansatz of fast and slow variables and then within that ansatz, and it's basically separation of variables. Mm -hmm. So, 
It's, it's true. I, I mean, I think this this idea could be applied to other problems, actually. I think, and I think, I think, yeah. The, you see, the formalism is more general because it applies to the analysis of an arbitrary differential equation. You're not just looking at you know moments. In the same sense, do you think that this form of homogenization theory is applicable for germ processes as well? Did you meet? I mean, you could exactly pose the same questions for germ processes, right? Yeah, well, I, 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 guess, I guess for germ processes, there must be a way of doing it, right? I mean... Uh, but you haven't, you, you, yeah. you haven't tried it. So, so yeah, because, and I guess it would pro probably be quite interesting because the fast, the, the fast variable will stay discrete, right? Yeah. And the, uh, and the slow variable will probably be become continuous, right? It doesn't need to be, I think, yeah. but okay. Well, but, it'll, but it'll you become continuous all... because, you know, if you have P of I, okay. if okay. you've got P of I, I over root T, right? And as, you know, so but you can I... also easily get into trouble by, if you would formally take the fast limit, that there would be more than one invariant measure. And that could probably upset the analysis, I would imagine. Well, that's, that's true. I don't know what happens. If, yeah, if, if there's more than one invariant measure, yeah. that would be interesting, yeah, right? So, so you, see, you yeah. have to deal with the degeneracy then and to pick yeah. up the right limiting value. You cannot just solve the limiting equations then. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, are there other questions? <clears throat> okay, please. So, uh, I don't know whether this question is already answered, but what does intermediate uh, values of alpha correspond to? Neither zero nor one. So I mean, if you think about it, so so if, if so, the extreme values are zero is you know it's a crystal, so very hard repulsion, right? You know, so you basically you know, it, um, <clears throat> so you take some sort of interaction which is hard, you know, like hard, you know, um, you, know you, you pump up the interaction, you form a crystal, right? You go to a phase where you form a, you know, if you have a crystal phase, right, you're going to have very small oscillations about the, the crystal structure. So that's, that's the alpha equals zero limit, right? But you could think of having a softer system with an interaction which allowed the particles to, you know, get closer to each other and have bigger fluctuations. So, you know, in principle, at least, at least the level, you know, one way of seeing it is, okay, if you, do, if you look at some sort of weak coupling limit, okay, the structure factor is, you know, the random phase approximation, it's, you know, something like 1 over 1 minus beta V of Q, right? V tilde of Q, where V tilde is the, is, V tilde is the, 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 the Fourier transform of the interaction potential, okay? So for weak coupling, you know, it's, it's just a matter of tuning uh, V tilde of Q, right? So, so you, could, you could presumably get away from the, uh, you know, you can't do that, obviously, when you go to the, the crystal structure, because weak coupling won't work. But if you start from this... Uh, if you start from the Poisson distribution for the ideal gas, then you could do perturbation and you would, right? So does this calculation go through if we consider a non-homogeneous initial condition, not a Poisson measure, especially varying initial condition? Not yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So, so the, the, initial, the, the initial conditions are, you know, the, the initial conditions are Poisson. The, the, that's the initial conditions. You're going to Poisson. And you can have this, uh, you know, you can have this uh, this hard core, but you can also have, you know, spatially varying. You can actually have a distribution, of, or you can have a distribution of the particles to start with. This is what I call this uh, this p zero of x, right? So you can have some sort of very, you know, jaggy periodic potential where all of the particles were, you know, and now actually. So this is the thing. You can imagine if you take a periodic potential which is very deep, okay? Then, uh, the, 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 and, but your final potential is very shallow, that you'll get the same result at late times. You might say that's a bit odd because all of the particles will be at the bottom of wells, but there's nothing to stop two particles being at the bottom of the same well, right? So just having a, a periodically varying potential doesn't mean the particles are periodically spaced because they're not interacting, okay? So you can have, yeah, it, it is in here, the periodically varying initial conditions. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank... David Gaudet. David Gaudet. Yeah. And let's move to our second talk okay. of this oh, session sorry, yes. by Shamik.
Okay, so our second speaker is uh, Shamik Gupta from uh, Tata Institute from Mumbai. So please, uh, Shamik, when you are ready, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, so let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about some work on quantum systems, which was done primarily with my former PhD student, Debrat Das, who is now a postdoc at, uh, at ICTP. And uh, then uh, we did some extensions of that work with Sushanta Datta Gupta from NIT Durga. OK, so what is the, let me just see. Yeah, so what is the problem that we want to study? So before I get to the actual setup, let me give a you know caricature of, uh, so we want to look at quantum evolution. So perhaps it's good to have a you know, bird's eye view of what quantumness uh, brings in vis-a-vis -vis, uh, classical evolution. So, so here is an example of a classical random walk. And as you can see, this is the walker, which is, you know, walking randomly. So the thing to note is that in a given realization of the dynamics, the particle is going to be on, on a particular site. Of course, that site will vary from one realization to another. But then at a given instant, it is either at this site or at some other site and so on. But in the quantum case, what is going to happen is that for the same initial condition, when the particle starts from the same initial point, at any given instant, the particle has varying probabilities to be found on many different sites. Okay? So this, this is for one, uh, one evolution, and this is for, of course, one evolution. And the question is, how does this quantum randomness, the randomness that is arising due to quantum nature of evolution, affect the, uh, the dynamics of the system? And what sort of dynamics we are interested in? Uh, we are interested in uh, the situation in which I have an isolated quantum system, which is not quite isolated in the sense that the system is once in a while interacting with the environment. So let me get to the particular, sorry. I got this thing wrong. Uh, okay. So before I uh, get to the case of the system interacting with the environment, let me spend some time on a particular model that we are going to look at, which is going to mimic this sort of evolution. This is the uh, so-called tight binding model. So what is this model? This model is very simple. So it describes a single quantum particle, which is moving on a one-dimensional lattice. And this is the Hamiltonian of the system. The system evolves under unitary evolution dictated by this Hamiltonian. So what does this Hamiltonian tell you? It tells you that with a, a, you know, with a tunneling probability delta, the particle hops to nearest neighbor site. So if the particle is on site n, it hops to either the site to the right or to the left. Okay? And what are these n? These are states that, uh, uh, you know, that define the state of the particle while on site n. And this is defined on a one-dimensional lattice with, uh, uh, that extends all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is pure unitary evolution. And you may ask the following question that suppose I start with the particle on a given site n0 at time t equal to 0. And because the particle is moving on a lattice that extends all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity, of course, the particle is going to spread out over the lattice. So what is the probability PMT that the particle is on site M at a later time t equal to 0? Okay? And this problem is uh, very uh, well known and well studied. And what happens is that, uh, OK, so here is a picture of what happens in, in, in course of evolution of the system, that you start with the particle localized on this site, site number 25. That's why you see a delta function here. And as you wait longer and longer, the particle is going to spread out over larger and larger number of lattice sites. So therefore, you have delocalization of the system. Of course, the average displacement is going to be 0 because of the left-right symmetry of the problem uh, with respect to the like initial location. But if you look at the mean squared displacement, that is, if you ask what is the average of the displacement squared of the particle from its initial location, so there you see that it grows with time. Of course, it grows with time because the particle is moving on an infinite lattice. But uh, with respect to classical case, where you would have expected or you would have had this uh, mean squared displacement to grow linearly with time, 
Here you find that the mean squared displacement grows quadratically with time. That is the particle spreads much faster in the quantum case than in the classical case. And this is pure unitary evolution. Okay? And this problem can be you know, solved exactly. So I skip the details. Basically what you do is that, okay, this is a classical problem. We did not solve it. I mean, this is known in the literature. So what you do is that uh, the, you go to the what are known as block states. So block states, they are the Fourier transform of the one year states. One year states are the ones that uh, you know, determine the state of the particle on the real space. And block states correspond to the momentum space representation of these uh, states. And then uh, in the block space, uh, uh, in, the, in terms of the block states, uh, you can find this probability to be given exactly by the square of the Bessel function of the first kind. Now, what is the thing that we want to study? So, so far I talked about unitary evolution of a quantum system. Now, the question that we want to study is the following, that if you have an isolated quantum system, then of course we know that it undergoes unitary dynamics and the evolution is coherent. But then perfect isolation is never possible. Like any quantum system that you think of, it, it will never be completely isolated from the environment. Or another way to put it is that you would like to make some measurements on the system. And to do that, you would need to couple the system with a measuring apparatus. Okay, So the evolution is never going to be uh, completely isolated. So there will be external effects due to interactions with an external environment or a measuring apparatus. And these uh, interactions would lead to a non-unitary evolution and eventually to uh, uh, decoherence, to the phenomenon of decoherence. So here is a typical setup of a quantum system uh, undergoing this sort of evolution. So what you do is that you prepare the system in an initial state, and then you let the system evolve, but then not in isolation, but either in uh, you know, interaction with an external environment or with a measuring apparatus. So once in a while, you have this non-unitary evolution kicking in, and then you let the system evolve for a given amount of time. And then at the end of the day, when, you're, you know, when this evolution comes to an end, you do some detection, uh, some detection or some measurement. Now, these interactions, they kick in at random times. It's not that they happen regularly at uh, you know, every two seconds or five seconds. So what we would like to do is to study the case where you have a quantum system that is undergoing unitary evolution which is interspersed with non-unitary interactions at random times. Okay? So there are uh, two sources of randomness here. So the first source is, of course, quantum randomness. That is, the system, the, the, the evolution of the system is inherently quantum. And as I showed in one of my previous uh, slides, you know, you, at a given instant of time, the particle can be simultaneously present on many different sites. So that's due to the quantum evolution. But also, you have classical randomness because of the times at which random intera these interactions kick in. Okay? So there are two sources of randomness, this classical and quantum randomness. And this would lead to a, co a crossover between coherence and decoherence. Coherence when you have completely unitary evolution. And decoherence effects will come in when non-unitary interactions kick in at random times. So the question that we would like to study is, how does this crossover take place? Uh, between, cross, uh, between coherence and uh, decoherence uh, due to an interplay uh, between classical and quantum randomness. And we would like to study this in the context of the uh, tight binding model that I just described. But then we have developed a formalism that works very generally. It could be for any quantum system undergoing unitary evolution interspersed with non-unitary interactions at random times. So let me just go through it. So what we have is we have a very generic uh, quantum system described by a time-independent Hamiltonian. I'll show that you know this formalism can also be extended to time-dependent Hamiltonian as well. But for the moment, let's focus on time-independent Hamiltonian. And then I have unitary evolution interspersed with non-unitary interactions at random times. Okay? And this non-unitary interaction, they can be uh, couched in the form of an interaction operator T which could be completely arbitrary. And a typical evolution of the system would look somewhat like this, that this is your time axis. Time flows from right to left. So at t equal to 0, you prepare the system in an initial density operator rho 0. 
it could be a pure state, it could be a mixed state, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Then what you do is that you let the system evolve unitarily for a random time tau 1. Okay? And then at time instant t1, uh, this, this interaction kicks in. That is, you have some interaction with the external environment or you do some measurement on the quantum system. And then you let it evolve again unitarily for a second random interval tau 2 and so on. And let's say you make your measurement at this final instant time t. Okay? So this is one particular realization of the dynamics. As you can see, the randomness lies in the time instances at which interactions kick in and the number of times you have interactions taking place in a given duration or, uh, t. This is one realization of the dynamics and this is another realization. As you can see here, you have p number of interactions, here you have q number of interactions and these times are of course going to be different. And what, you know, one, one particular model that one can think of for these random times is the following, that you take them to be independent and identically distributed random variables taken from some distribution, sampled from some distribution p tau. So given this setup, uh, like as I mentioned, I would like to see the uh, interplay of classical and quantum randomness. Classical randomness is encoded in this uh, p tau, the choices of the random intervals, and quantum randomness because the system that you are studying is quantum. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, if I want to look at the time evolution of the density operator, that can be written down very simply because what you have is you have your initial density operator. You let it evolve unitarily for some random time tau 1. So this evolution is dictated by this Liouvillean operator e to the power minus i l t1. And then you have an interaction kicking in at time t1 which is given by this interaction operator t. Then you have like again unitary evolution for the time interval t2 minus t1 which is uh, described, uh, uh, which is denoted here by this Liouvillean, then again a factor of t and so on. So this will give you the density operator at time t for this particular realization of the dynamics. And L is, as I mentioned, L is the Liouvillean operator. So the way L acts on the density operator, this is the well-known formula that you take the density operator, you act on it by e to the power minus i l t, you get the density operator at a later instant. And this is related to the Hamiltonian in this particular manner. Now, this is the density operator for one particular realization, but you would like to, and I would show that, uh, I'm going to show later, that what you would like to know is what is the density operator when you average over many such dynamical realizations, okay? So, to do that, what I do is that I take this formula, which is written here in blue, but then I have to, in order to find the average density operator, I have to stick in factors for choosing a pro, uh, for choosing the time instant tau 1, which is p tau 1, for choosing the time instant tau 2, which is p t2 minus t1, and so on. So all these factors come in because you want to average over many different realizations. So therefore, you would ask how many times do I get realizations in which I have tau 1 appearing here, tau 2 appearing here. So that's why you get these factors. And you get this last factor, f t minus t p. That's the probability for no interaction during time t. Because in a given realization, if you have p number of interactions, then you know that there is going to be no interaction happening during this time t minus t p. So that's this probability factor. So this is for one, uh, you, you know, this is not all because p is also random and the time instances are also random. So what you need to do is you need to integrate over all these time instances and that you do it appropriately with appropriate limits. And the last thing that you need to do is to consider the number of interactions to also vary between zero and infinity because you may have in a given duration of time any number of interactions taking place. Okay? So this is the final formula. This is the average density operator at time t when you average over the classical randomness, that is the times at which interactions kick in. And you, you can put it in this form, this rho bar t is this uh, uh, operator times rho zero. This is called a super operator in the, I mean, these are terminologies borrowed from quantum optics, I think. It's 
called a super operator because it acts on an operator to give you another operator as opposed to a normal operator that acts on a ket vector to get a new uh, to give you a new ket vector so this is the final formula for the average density operator now this formula it looks quite you know cumbersome and difficult to tackle the way it stands here but then what you can do is that you can go to the laplace space and realize that you know the different factors that appear when you consider this integral and let's say these factors they are in the form of a convolution so when you go to the laplace space then this formula uh, you know simplifies significantly so this operator ut this is the super operator time evolution operator in the time domain when you go to the laplace space you have a very simple formula this u tilde s it uh, you know you have to do this thing and it appears as the uh, ratio of two factors in the numerator you have the laplace transform of this ft times e to the power minus ilt and in the denominator you have this interaction operator t and this these like other factors so this is the formula and further simplification takes place if you consider pt to be an exponential that is if you take these times to be exponentially distributed that is you are doing your measurements randomly in time with no correlation between two uh, successive measurements then the formula signifies simply uh, significantly simply because of the fact that if pt is an exponential then this e to the power minus lambda t you can club it with this e to the power minus ilt and you know what is the laplace transform of an exponential and if you do that then you get this u tilde s as kind of a dyson series so how, what does it look like so u tilde s you re, uh, recall this is the time evolution operator in the laplace space you can uh, you know decompose it as a factor u tilde 0s that involves no interaction over the time instead over the time duration t this is one interaction that's why you get a factor t only once here t factor appears twice that is you have two interactions taking place and so on and so forth okay and uh, it turns out that uh, you know the formalism that i just described you can extend it also to uh, the case of uh, you know time independent hamilton a uh, time dependent hamiltonian the only thing that you have to worry about is that if you are dealing with a time dependent hamiltonian then this exponential factors the time evolution factors would have to be properly time ordered okay that is the only complication that comes in but otherwise the whole uh, formalism goes through and uh, and in this formalism i did not specify any form of the hamiltonian and any form of the interaction operator simply because they don't matter at all whatever be the hamiltonian and whatever be the interaction operator this formalism will go through now i apply it to the tight binding model and and what i would like to show is that this kind of interaction with the external environment leads to some remarkable effects uh, and uh, you know they lead to some interesting results for the localization of the particle so i will consider this tight binding model uh, subject to two representative interactions that is i'll make two, two particular choices of this interaction operator t so one is what is known as projective measurement that i guess all of you are familiar with from quantum mechanics courses and second one is the stochastic reset so in the rest of the talk what i'll do is i'll tell you what are they what are these things projective measurements and stochastic resets where do they lead to and how and why so that's more or less the rest of the talk uh, is going to be on so let me first uh, talk about projective measurements so here is a caricature of what happens if i consider this tight binding model subject to projective measurements at random times so a projective measurement is a particular form of interaction what what does it do and the it has to do with interaction with an external apparatus external measuring uh, like measurement apparatus so this is a you know a representative uh, uh, dynamical evolution so what you do is that you remember you have this tight binding model where you have a particle which is diffusing on a one dimensional lattice so let's say you start with the particle localized on this particular site zero okay so this is my lattice and this is my uh like initial uh, density profile like initial probability density of the particle you have a delta function at zero 
and you let it evolve unitarily for some random time and if you do so then what is going to happen is that the particle is going to spread over the lattice and that is reflected in this density profile, this probability density uh, assuming a particular structure in space. Okay? And then let's say after you have let it evolve for this random time you make a measurement at time t equal to, uh, at, at, at site m equal to 0. You can do this measurement at any other site, but this is just for representative purpose that let's say you make a measurement at m equal to 0, then if you make a measurement, then subsequent to the measurement, what you are left with is the projected component of the wave function. So therefore, your density profile would look just, uh, you know, you will be left with just the bit around m equal to 0, the, the site at which you are making the measurement. And then you let it evolve unitarily for another random duration. So therefore, this one will again spread out. And then again, you make a measurement at m equal to 0, and you will be left with just a bit at m equal to 0. So every time you make a measurement, what is happening is that the norm of the vector, the state vector, is going to decrease in time. Right? And then you would like to ask the following question that suppose I start at site N0 and perform these projective measurements to some particular site N0 at random times. So what is the survival probability of the system? Okay. Survival probability is just the, you know, the norm of the wave vector at time t. Because every time you make a projective measurement, subsequent to a projective measurement, you are left with the projected component of the wave function or the state vector while uh, a part of the wave function gets into the Hilbert space of the measuring apparatus. So you would like to know how does this uh, projected component and the norm of the, uh, the, the projected component decay as a function of time. And in fact, this problem, uh, you know, is related to the uh, uh, well-known Zeno problem in quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. So in Zeno problem, what you do is that you prepare the system in an initial state and after a regular interval of time, you make a measurement to this initial state. You make a projective measurement to this initial state. And what has been shown in a very uh, uh, famous paper by Sudarshan and uh, Mishra is that if you do these measurements frequently enough, then what you see is that the system seems to have been frozen in its initial state. You don't see an evolution of the system. Okay? And you see similar results here. So here, of course, what do I, uh, you know, one difference I have to mention, and that is the following, that in the Zeno case, you make measurements after a regular interval of time term. Here, I'm not constrained to do that. I do measurements after random times. I don't care about, you know, when I'm making the measurement. I just come once in a while and turn on my measurement apparatus and do a measurement. And what we see is that, if I, you know, compute this quantity, this is the survival probability or, you know, PN0 T average, this is the probability to be at the initial state at time T. You start at N0, you do measurements at N0 after random times and you ask what is the probability that you are still at N0 at the initial location at time T, okay? That, of course, Yeah, you have a collapse of the wave function. Yeah. You get with certain probability a delta function or not a delta function if you use usual formalism of quantum mechanics. Yes, so what you do is that I'm working with the projected component, okay? So when you are doing a measurement, you collapse onto the N0 state, okay? With certain probability, you, you find a particle at zero or not. Yeah, so then what I do is that subsequently, I just work with the part in which I have the particle at N0. But why don't you start, for, I mean, you, if you know that the particle is there, you have a delta function at that point. No, the probability <laughs> will decrease, right? Because I have the wave vector, which is normalized okay, so to it's, unity. So it's not the usual uh, collapse that you're doing. No, it's not the usual collapse in that sense, yeah. So this P N0 T average, this is the probability that you are still at site N0 after time T, okay? And what you see is that, of course, it will decay as a function of time, but then what our calculation shows is that it decays like this, 1 minus delta square T by lambda. So therefore, if you make lambda to be infinite, that is, if you do measurements frequently enough, 
Lambda, remember, is the rate at which you are making measurements. So therefore, if you do measurements at frequently enough time intervals, then what you see is that you have a suppression of this probability. That is, it seems as though the system is frozen in, in, in its initial condition and like initial state. And this suppression is comparable, like you get the same result in conventional Zeno effect in which you make measurements at regular intervals. But the good thing about this setup is that here you are doing measurements at random intervals. So therefore, you are not constrained to rely on the precision of your timing device to do measurements at regular intervals. So the upshot of the whole story is that you can get comparable suppression of you know, decay of this probability in this setup. But then you can do measurements at random times. And yet you are able to achieve the same level of suppression of the probability. So this is one example in which one can apply this setup. And this is an example of, a, of an experiment which was done in the uh, uh, Florence group, which motivated us to do this, uh, uh, you know, to study this particular setup. So what you do, what they do is that this is an actual experiment, not a theorist's experiment. So what you do is that you have these two energy levels. So they consider a rubidium atom, the ground state of rubidium atom in presence of a magnetic field. So what they do is that they have these two levels, mf equal to 0 and like, OK, f equal to 1, mf equal to 0, f equal to 2, mf equal to 0, these two hyperfine levels. And they have one laser. What that laser does is that it leads to you know population inversion between these two levels. Okay, so that laser is the first laser is on all the time. So a laser induced Raman transition that couples these two levels. So you have population inversion. The number of atoms here and there uh, keeps on oscillating as a function of time. But once in a while, what they do is that they turn on a second laser. Which is uh, which is re uh, which is like resonant with transition from f equal to two to some other level f prime three, which is outside, like somewhere here. So what it does is that the second laser depletes the number of atoms in the in the excited level. Okay, so this is uh, tantamount to doing a projective measurement that once in a while you are depleting the number of uh, atoms which are there in the system. So you start with 50, and then you have oscillations between these two levels of that number 50. And once in a while, you excite some of the atoms here to some, some other level, which is outside your, uh, you know, this accessible, experimentally accessible, uh, like energy level duo. And what it does is that it reduces the number of atoms which are there left in the system after the, after the measurement. And one can do it at random times. And in, in fact, that's what they did. And, uh, uh, I mean, experimentally, it is much easier to do such measurements at random times than at regular intervals of time. And what we, our theoretical results showed and what has been confirmed by them also, that you get comparable suppression of, uh, you know, the, the survival probability if you do measurements at frequent enough time intervals. The second problem that I want to study has to do with the reset, stochastic reset. So here is a representation of how does the dynamics look like. So you have your lattice and you have your initial, uh, you have your particle localized initially on site m equal to 0. You let it evolve randomly for some time. Uh, you let it evolve unitarily for some random time. And what is going to happen is that the uh, density profile will acquire a shape of this sort. It will spread, the particle will spread out over the lattice. And then what you do is that you reset. What, what reset would mean is that you restart your experiment. You stop your experiment and start again from this initial condition. And then you let it evolve for, again, a random time duration. Okay? And then again, you start afresh. And you keep on doing it. You keep on uh, you know, doing these two things repeatedly, stopping and starting. And in this case, you may ask the question, suppose I start at n0 and do stochastic resets, that is this sort of stopping and starting at random times, then how does this probability look like? PMT is what is the probability for the particle to be on site m at time t. Now, recall that in the uh, tight binding case, when you did not have any measurements or any interaction with the environment, simply because 
you had an infinite lattice, a lattice that extended from minus infinity to plus infinity, the particle uh, was spreading out over larger and larger separation as, uh, you know, as you wait longer and longer. But here, if you do this stochastic research, then what happens is that you are able to localize the particle as you, it is seen here, that at t equal to 1, you start with the particle localized at site, uh, you know, 25, and at times 15 and 20, you see that the density profile is not changing as a function of time. So therefore, you are able to arrest the delocalization of the particle by doing this research at random time. So this sort of effect has been, of course, observed in the classical, uh, uh, you know, classical case, and Satya and Martin, both of them are here. So they were the ones to study this in the classical case. But, you know, uh, in the quantum case, we have an example where a similar effect uh, ensues. And uh, that's, of course, because of the um, interplay between the classical and the quantum randomness. Okay? So this is uh, what I mentioned here. Sorry. Uh, Time-dependent probabilities to be on different sites that uh, assumes a time-independent form. So you have a localization induced by this uh, research. Uh, okay, let me skip this one. So uh, how much time do I have? Yeah, 15 minutes. Okay, okay. So maybe I'll just quickly go over how does one do this calculation. Uh, maybe it's not so interesting, but let me go through it anyways. So the idea to deal with uh, you know uh, this sort of problem is, as I mentioned, to go to the Laplace space. So this is the average density operator in the Laplace space that is given by this super operator, u tilde times your like, initial density operator. And this can be decomposed uh, as a series that involves no interaction or one interaction or two interactions and so on. But the good thing about this structure is that u tilde 0s is what is the bare, uh, what is the, you know, this corresponds to the bare evolution, the evolution that does not involve any uh, interaction with the external environment. And for the tight binding model, or let's say if you have a model for which you know the, you are able to solve the bare evolution, then you can like easily, uh, you know, get these uh, different terms uh, because you know this u tilde 0s. And if you plug in the particular interaction that you want to study, uh, in the form of this T, then you are able to get this form in the Laplace space. For example, uh, let me just go back. Uh, for example, for the case of projective measurement, how do I determine the form of this operator T? So I require that this rho plus T, this is the density oper operator after the projective measurement, which is of course given by rho plus T is equal to T times rho minus T. Rho minus t is the density operator just prior to the measurement. Acting on it by t, I get the projective measure, uh, I get the density operator after the projective measurement. And I want this rho plus t to be of the form uh, nn. That is, if I want to project the system to a particular state n, then this projection operator has to be of the form uh, this nn, right? This uh, ket nn bra n. And this fixes the form of the um, uh, T operator. See, one thing that T, it's not quite a matrix because it's a super operator because it acts on an operator to give you another operator. Therefore, it has got four indices. Okay? So that's why uh, these are, you know, since it has four, matrix, uh, four indices, these are denoted by round back brackets as opposed to angular brackets. And then in order to compute PM bar T, let's say what is the probability to be on site M at time T, what you need to do is you need to find rho bar T and sandwich it between the, uh, you know, the bra and ket M. And it's basically, you know, if I plug in this particular form of U tilde S, then in the Laplace space, it would appear as, you know, PM bar tilde S to be equal to this, where P means that I have p number of interactions, okay? And let me skip this algebra, but what I want to show is that in the Laplace space, it becomes very easy to evaluate these matrix elements simply because I know the form of the time evolution operator for the Bayer tight binding model. 
So I guess uh, these things are boring, but uh, you know, I just wanted to flash that you know, all these things can be computed exactly using the formalism. And so is the case for stochastic resets. Like, uh, like again, you have to uh, you know, find the particular form of the density operator by requiring that in the case of stochastic reset, what I, should, what I require is that the trace of the density operator should be the same before and after the measurement. So that fixes the form of the interaction operator T. And again, I can go through this, uh, you know, uh, these steps uh, like uh, this sort of algebra to compute the quantities of interest. Let me skip this one. So let me just come to the conclusions. Okay, there's one more model in which we studied, uh, you know, uh, this coherence to decoherence crossover. Namely, this is the tight binding model subject to a periodic field. And there also one can see signatures of localization induced by stochastic resets. So, um, so these are the main points. So first of all, uh, we have localization induced by stochastic resets that in, in the tight binding model, in absence of periodic field, you have an unbounded mean square displacement that gets bounded when you have uh, the tight binding model subject to stochastic resets both in presence and absence of periodic field. In case of projective measurements, what we showed is that you can get suppression of, uh, you know, uh, freezing of the system in the initial condition if you, do, uh, uh, if you do measurements at frequent enough intervals. But com compared to the usual setup of Zeno effect where you are constrained to do measurements at regular intervals, here you can do measurements at random intervals, which is much more easy to implement. Get similar suppression of uh, the decay of the probability. Um, and so at the moment we are working on, uh, you know, how this setup can be used to study similar effects in many body interacting systems, because the system that I described had only one particle which is moving on a lattice. So what happens if you have more particles and what does interaction bring in uh, in this whole game of uh, classical and quantum randomness? And I think, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Shami. <laughs> okay, so we have time for questions. Okay, Manas, maybe? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, is ah. there, a, uh, for the localization induced by resetting, do you have a precise relation between localization length and the resetting rate? Uh, do we have a uh, relation between the localization? Yes, of course, yeah, we have it, yes. So how does it, uh, so what is I the form? I don't know offhand, but it can, be, it can be found out. I mean, I have the, so what I need to do is I need to tell you how does the probability, this uh, probability decay as a function of the uh, separation from its initial location. Mm -hmm. Now that has a uh, form involving this Bessel function. So one can be, uh, okay, one can uh, in principle, in practice also extract the length from that formula. We haven't done it, but it can be done because okay. the formula is exact. We have an exact formula for the probability density as a function of the separation. So it is the Laplace transform of the Bessel functions? Right? Yes, yes. So that, okay, so that from there you can. Yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks. Satya? I just want to make a comment that, you know, I mean, the, the stochastic resetting in the quantum sense, I mean, it was actually, you know, first done in 2018 in a paper yes, by yes. Krishnan Dushan yes. Gupta and myself and uh, Vaskar Mukherjee. So this whole formalism is actually already done for a general case. I mean, what you did is for the special case of tight binding model yes, yes. and yes. calculating the yes. survival probability. So that's yeah. Okay. okay, are there questions or comments? Questions there? Hi, so uh, at least for the measurement case, uh, I mean, your dynamics looks Markovian. Uh, is this equivalent to some Lindblad? Or can, can you get some? Yeah, you Lindblad? can write down a Lindblad equation. I, I mean, for this uh, case, it is, uh, you know, you can write down, uh, you know, from this formula, uh, the formula that I showed initially. Yeah. So if you just take this equation and take the time derivative, it, it turns out to be a Lindblad equation. 
Markovian. But, but do you get a Lindler operator which is which does not depend on the state? Is state independent Lindler operator? Yeah, state independent Lindler <coughs> operator. Okay. 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 Yes. Any other question? No. Oh, sorry. Other questions? Or? Manas again? Uh, sorry, this is a little bit of a general question. So, uh, when you say interactions right here, uh, the point is you're mainly talking about projective measurements, right? But uh, the class of, so when I think of interactions, one possible thing is that after some time window, you turn on another Hamiltonian and then, then turn it off and then turn on your original Hamiltonian. So that kind of setups don't fall into this, right? Uh, I mean, when we say interaction with the environment, I would imagine you first do a unitary evolution, then at some random time, couple it to an environmental Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. and then maybe switch it off, and then again run it with your original Hamiltonian. So no, that this, is... Uh, no, this T, T is providing an effective description of that particular thing. That, you know, at a random time, you turn on a coupling between the system and the environment, so you have... At that particular instant, the system described by H plus H prime, something like that, right? But this T is encoding that information in an effective manner. So I'm looking at the reduced description of the system. So in your case, I have to look at the description of the system in terms of the Hilbert space of the system plus the environment. Right, right. But is there a systematic way of uh, going from there to here? For, uh, Somehow, I mean, I understand, but is, is there a rigorous way of, uh, you know, having that microscopic setup and maybe doing some perturbative, treating the system bath coupling as perturbative and writing a Lindblad equation or whatever, if and the, then... If the T would be a Lindblad, you're generated by a Lindblad, your logic would be out. Because then you do exactly what you say, but in a, in a reduced description, you get a Lindblad. Yeah, but is it, is it obvious that T could be generated by a Lindblad? Yes. Uh, I mean, if you write down the time evolution equation, it has the form of a Lindblad, and T is providing that effective description. Because here we are looking at the reduced description. It's not a measurement, it's really Lindblad Lindblad. So it's not a, it's not a, a measurement. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll discuss it later. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I have the short question. You show, you show the plot of PM, I mean, the case, in the case of uh, stochastic resetting, you show the plot of PM, T for different times. But it seems that at early time, the, the, the PM, or the wave function, I mean, slightly uh, widens and then shortens again. Is, is that correct? Yeah, the, uh, yeah this so one? There was, yeah, there were some kinds of wings that develops and yes, they yes. shrink up again, or is that? Yeah, like initially, of course, I mean, you have to wait for some time for uh, localization to set in. And like sure. initially, you get this, uh, you know, you are asking why there are these yeah, wings. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, because they can, okay, like initially you start at site, you know, N0, but then sooner what will happen is that you will have enhanced probability of finding the particle on either side, and because there is a left-right symmetry, so you get some, you know, enhanced probability on either side, and, you know, you have, a, you know, decreased probability at the initial site, and so this sort of again. continues. Okay, yes. But at some point, you know, when you have localization, then you have a more... Yeah. Uh, uh, flat profile. Okay, okay. Okay, well, let's thank Shamik again. Okay, so I guess we go for lunch and then we again meet at uh, two thirty. Oh, you can leave the bags. I think they're going to lock it. They're going to lock the room. Yeah, you can give the bags. Yeah. Okay,